it's totally valid to feel like we're in sort of fall of the Republic territory here because we are. I mean, this is, uh, you know, probably something like crisis of the third century if we're comparing Western civilization to Rome. Uh, so we've pro- we've, I think we probably do have a couple hundred years left to go. Uh, but I think it's evident that whatever we've been doing to bring us to this point is leading us on a path to destruction. Are you the most demonetized man on the internet? Um, uh, possibly. Uh, well, I mean, a lot, a lot of people have also been demonetized. So, uh, not including the federalist though, apparently <laughs> they just had to turn off their comment section at Google's behest. Otherwise they would have been, but yeah, zero hedge, Stephen Crowder, myself, and a bunch of other people can thank you. You know, we've, we'll get demonetized because we say things that are not very politically correct, I suppose. It's happened twice but, uh, to you now though, right? It has. So what, yeah. what was three the... times actually? Actually, four times now I think about it. <laughs> you are, <laughs> dude, that's the title. That title's yours to I take. I know, it's happened a lot. Um, it's, it's just because I talk about things that the progressives also talk about, but I don't talk about them in a progressive way. And so I'm a bad person. So what's the current makeup of your youtube verse at the moment? You've got a multiple uh, channels, right? Yeah, the only one I really use at the moment is a CAD daily because I'm currently setting up a website um, to do the same sort of things through. Um, and I'll start a podcast and other things after I've done that. So I'm just using this one at the moment. Got you. And then you've still got the like the old archived one, the grandfathered one. Yeah, yeah. But um, YouTube have uh, quarantined it in some way. So, well, and I tested this the other day on my new channel. I've got 300,000 subscribers. And if I put up a video within the first like 18 hours, I'll have a million impressions and some like 200,000 views. Um, and on my old channel, I put it up and in the first 18 hours, I had about a hundred thousand impressions and, it, and that's got nine hundred. That's got three times the subscriber base as my new channel. And yet it'll get something like, you know, a 10th of the views. And it's crazy because I'm, I'm, my content isn't, I don't think, markedly different. My audience still seems to be there. So it seems very much that the channel itself has been throttled in some way. So I guess I just have to leave it. You I know? love the idea of a quarantine channel. Uh, yeah, well, it happened to Tommy Robinson as well. And it's it's happened to a few. Um, but these days, they're just outright taking them down. Uh, there, there have been um, people who are, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, People who are more, much more extreme than me, who uh, have been slowly, the the noose has been tightening, and now we've come to conservative channels because all of the alt right or anything like they're all gone now, uh, they're all on different platforms. So the noose is just growing tighter, and uh, you can see that people get targeted before they get removed as well. Like Katie Hopkins and Milo have their blue check marks removed for their verification check marks on Twitter removed, which is weird because it just kind of shows that it's not about verification. It's about a privilege, isn't it? I mean, Milo and Katie didn't stop being Milo and Katie <laughs> and no one thought that they did, you know, and since they, they were public figures of note, you would think that it would be important for the public to easily identify them, but apparently not. Is a warning shot works. across the bow then. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it is. And I, th- I think, I mean, Facebook actually has an active list of, uh, I can't remember exactly what they call the list, but essentially it just translates to wrong thinkers. Uh, I'm actually on it, and a lot of other people were on it who have been removed. I don't know how I still have a Facebook presence, but I mean, I don't say anything that's that's wrong, you know, or crazy or even bigoted or anything like that. You know, I don't even make jokes anymore um, because you can't have any fun on the internet anymore, apparently. But increasingly, I've noticed that your stuff appears to be more and more you kind of treading. It sounds a little bit sometimes like you are treading on ice. Well, we are. There's very much a sword of Damocles hanging above our heads, and it's fallen a few times and cut me already. So uh, <laughs> You've got the scars to prove it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I've got the scars to prove it. That's right. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I just have to, have to be... The, the thing that's really interesting is the way this all worked out because i i can't help but notice that you're in your house in your bedroom mm-hmm. uh doing this and i began in very much the same way i just had a one bedroom flat and i was just doing it in my living room you know because I, at the time i was unemployed so i was just like well i may as well and it grew, took off um I mean, now i have a converted garage as my office but uh you know i started in very much the same position and 
it's interesting how we're being held to the same standards as something like CNN or Fox News, you know, giant organizations with hundreds of employees. And we're being held to the same standards, which really makes you wonder why they need all of that to do their jobs, doesn't it? You know, if it's so easy that just, you know, guys in, in their homes can do as effective a job, then maybe uh, maybe there's a there's a veil that they're hiding behind. This was a point that Eric Weinstein made on Joe Rogan's podcast better than I've heard anyone make it. And what he said was that people refer to the mainstream media now. Mm. That's what they do, CNN, the BBCs, yeah. so on and so forth. But Corporate like, media. Hang on a second. If this podcast, me and you, Joe Rogan, or me and you, if this gets 100 million views, which would be great, uh, but if this gets 100 million views and CNN puts a video up and it gets 500,000 views, who's mainstream media now? Now you can call them traditional media. Mm. Traditional media is a nice word. But they don't want that because mainstream's a signal. Mainstream is we are the arbiters of truth. We are the yes. ones that. It, it, it is. It, what, what, what we mean when we say mainstream isn't really the view counts, and it hasn't been for a while. And that's why we're being treated as competitors to them. Uh, but what they're talking about is approved. These are the approved media, the approved gateways. The ratified the, ones. Yeah, exactly. The, the people. And the thing is, because it is all a system that interlocks, you can. Uh, <clears throat> sorry you can understand why they would want such a thing because it puts them all essentially on the same team when it comes to certain issues uh the for example the bbc they brag about how everyone still comes to the bbc when they want to get you know the, the coronavirus information and it's like okay that's true but you are also a privileged source because of your access the politicians make the platforms as much as the platforms make the politicians. Uh, if politicians wanted, they could just refuse to do interviews with any of the media and just do interviews on their own YouTube channels using a smartphone or something. You know, they could say, look, here's the questions I want to answer, blah, 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 blah. Thanks very much. And then the media would have to extract from that. And then they would just be just like anyone else. But it's access that they have. And this is it, this, it's a two-way street. They, there are, they, it's, from from my time dealing with all of this, and I've I've met a few very interesting people in my time, it's very much about who you know, because there's no shortage of people, there's a shortage of trust, and so it's about making creating like webs of trust between people, and uh, and it's very, and the thing is, I don't see how it could operate any other way. That's the problem, uh, because you've got too many people who are pulling at you. I would say. So I think it's probably inevitable it's going to work that way. But yeah, so essentially when you're someone like me and you come from it from the complete outside, you know, I didn't I didn't have any of this. Um I can see why they hate us, you know. <laughs> Just I some can, guy in I his garage. Really see why they some hate guy us. in his garage, yeah. 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 We're, and because we can say things that they can't say. We can challenge narratives they don't dare challenge. Um and they'll punish us for it. That's what they're doing. I think the long-term move of Joe Rogan to Spotify, I had a chat with a guy from Podcast Notes earlier on who understands the infrastructure very cleverly. And oh, yeah. um, he thinks that the long-term goal for Spotify with podcasting will be something similar to what Netflix has done. That mm -hmm. if you signal to all of the big players, get the big players on board, play count goes up, easier views are available on there, they can monetize more highly. Then once they get critical mass of podcasters across, that's where you need to go to put your podcast on to get the plays. Then yep. once you're there, they can start to squeeze down the earning potential. Now, I hope that it's not as Orwellian as that. And I also think the one, um, the final bastion, like the last stand that you have as a content creator is you giving your word that you agree with the particular advert so the difference in conversions yeah. on a dynamic versus a host red is huge it's like 4x basically so joe rogan saying i i use this I endorse, yeah. cbd blah yeah. uh versus it being have you got your new copy of learning and housewife magazine from wh smith's yeah. get your first you know it just doesn't convert as well so i think that's yeah. maybe the chink in the armor but that could be long term you know yeah, I mean, oh, this honestly, this is a part of the reason why I'm setting up my own site, you know, so I don't have to be reliant on any one host or anything like that. Um, as long as you don't turn into Brian Rose from London Real, that would make me... I don't know who that is, sorry. Good, that is that is the the most blissful situation that you could hope to be in, my friend. I'll, I'll try and keep it that yeah, yeah, that would be great. Okay, so, meat of it. How 
would you describe 2020 to someone that had been in a coma since Christmas? Um, well, I mean, it, it's not really very different to what I've been saying this whole time. It's just that here it is all come to fruition. I mean, it's, it's really weird listening to, um, mainstream voices basically sound like my 2017 videos. And it's really interesting that essentially everything I was saying, this is not just, um, what, what we are seeing is not just people complaining about police brutality, right? This is fundamentally a, a communist revolution that has been brewing in academia, teaching a generation to think that capitalism and the West is evil. And this gives them moral license to tear it all down. I mean, a statue of George Washington was torn down in Portland the other day because uh, apparently he was a, a slave owning racist. And it's like, well, I mean, it, you know, the United States is going to be tainted by this original sin that it can never overcome. Ex and obviously we are as well. And so this, this just means that these people have an emotional um, sort of disposition against the thing that they're attacking. Like they, they, I don't think they'll ever be able to become patriotic again because they've been emotionally conditioned to hate that thing. You know, like it, they, the demands they're going to make are also going to be insane, which they are uh, like demanding, get rid of the police and things like this. And you'll see, hear people say, Oh no, we just want to, you know, police reform bullshit. You know, the, the activists, the radicals, the people who are actually driving this are quite open. They want to get rid of the police. And that would be, I mean, there, there have been examples of police going on strike and it within hours devolves into an anarchic situation. And we can see from the Chaz or the chop as they're calling it now, uh, that this isn't exactly a productive way of life. Is it, you know, we have law and order and justice, uh, you know, judiciary and a government for a reason as, as evil as they can be at times we still do need them in general, you know? So, um, basically we have to understand that this is a communist revolution that we are watching, which is why they do all the same things as previous communist revolutions, like setting up a commune, you know, uh, tearing down the established order, the statues of the established order. And they're just very open about saying they want to get rid of capitalism. Like black lives matter did a fundraiser in the UK. That's probably earned over a million pounds. Now it was seven fifty when I last looked at it. And on the, on the first line, it's like, we're here to dismantle, cap dismantle capitalism, imperialism, white supremacy, hetero patriarchy and stuff like that. And people are looking at Nigel Farage and Farage is, is finally saying, well, look, these people are actually communists who are here to take over capitalism, uh, which I was saying. And everyone's like, well, you can't prove him wrong, can you? you know, none it's of in that the first stuff, line. None of that stuff sounds to me like the first, the best way to progress black people in this world. It's not the best way to do anything. <laughs> it's, that's the problem. The, the, the problem with communism is it's a religion masquerading as an economic system. Like, Nobody would want, no, nobody would question what side is more productive. Like when the Soviet Union fell, they, Americans sent economists over there to do an analysis. And they basically found that they were earning about half as much as they could be just given what they had. It's just the, the means of distribution being centralized and top down demolish any kind of incentive. Like when you take away the security of the protection of your own private property, you've got no reason to get up every day and start building something. You know, why would you, if it's just going to be taken away from you? And so it's very difficult to motivate people. Um, and it's obvious that this is the case, but it's not about that. What it's about is establishing something that they can feel is perfect and moral because it's all predicated on morality. Like it, like they'll say things like capitalism will never end inequality. Well, no, that's true. But inequality is such a fundamental part of diversity that why would it even be desirable to do that? If we were all equal, we'd have to be all the same. And therefore there's no diversity. Like there's a natural difference. There's always going to be people at different heights. And if you want everyone to be the same, then your only option is the lowest common denominator because you can't raise up people who aren't going to be raised and you, you'll have to pull down people who otherwise wouldn't stay at the bottom rung. Um, but yeah, so essentially we have to deal with it in these terms. It's, it's a moral crusade that the communists are on and they literally don't think there's anything moral about our system, which they've pathologized as whiteness.
even if it's not necessarily white. It's there's a yeah. number of black people that can be on that other side of the fence. It's if you don't agree with a particular ideology. So yeah. how how has this year fitted together? How do you think that coronavirus contributed to this or Trump being impeached or the impending general election, the uh, American presidential election? Have you got some sort of conception of how that fits together? Does it even all fit together? Well, I think that the coronavirus, um, I, I don't know. You get people saying, well, this probably accelerated things. So, well, maybe. I, 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 you know, I honestly, I don't think anyone can really be sure of that. So I'm not going to suggest that's an, a causal factor, especially as I don't think it needs to have been in play to be a causal factor. Um, it could just be that it set the stage, but I, but the, the Tinder, you know, you know, like, but the Tinder was already there. You know, it was already ready for the match to be flicked into it. Maybe it just packed it in more tightly so the explosion was bigger or something. But like the what what we've been seeing is the result of a consistent pattern of activism from a consistent set of beliefs that have recognizable public figures as, as adherents and thought leaders. Uh, Robin D'Angelo is the person who's like trending in these spheres at the moment. Her book White Fragility was at number one. So it's and it's worth reading. Because it's unapologetic. I mean, I made I was reading it earlier. I made some notes. Hang on, let me just re read you a quick line or something from it because it's just crazy. Um, the 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 whole point um, is she thinks she's saying to white people what people of color can't tell us, and she views white culture as being like, and she just says white because it's in the American context but she's talking about the sort of Anglo-Saxon Protestant European culture that America was founded on because of the English colonies. Um, she views that as a kind of ethnic attack on non-white people. That's what whiteness is. And that's what white supremacy just is. Just by the, existing. But ju not, not just by existing, uh, but yes, it is just by existing, but the, it's in the way that it is different to these other cultures. It's, uh, individualistic and meritocratic, for example, these are the two big pillars that she uses about whiteness, um, which yeah, it would be, you would expect that it's, it comes from England, which was an individualistic society and it's meritocratic because it's a Protestant society. It's very geared around personal hard work. Uh, this, this has been a, a like a, a moral tradition in England, you know, you, you went and it, it infects every part of the culture. So like, you know, when you're poor, you are ashamed of being poor because the implication in the English moral system is that you've been lazy, right? It's that you are a free man. You know, the, this is, this was the point of being a free man is that you had control of your life. And if you're poor, that means you're not working very hard, right? That's, it, I'm not saying it's the case. It's just the moral implication of the thing. Um, and so that's why there's shame attached to being poor in, in English cultures, um, but the, the, the whole structure, the, the individualistic meritocratic, that is a form of racism in and of itself. That's the racist thing. And that's what white Europeans do in America. And therefore, whiteness, which is the desire for an individualistic meritocratic culture, needs to be destroyed. And what she's doing is trying to create a kind of white identity that is effectively laden with the presumably Catholic guilt that Miss D'Angelo has held over from her uh, her parents and load this identity onto people saying, look, whiteness is a form of oppression. It is inherently racist. You need to you know, understand that you're someone who perpetuates it by having standards, by wanting to be treated like an individual, to be, you know, to be concerned about merit, to be concerned about skill in the things that are going on rather than arbitrary and and expressly identity politics category. She, she's just open saying, no, I'm arguing from identity politics for white people. So in many ways, she's actually very similar to Richard Spencer because that was exactly his message. Do you don't... want to become a Nazi? That's your option. D'Angelo is offering it, and I'm saying no to that. <laughs> no, no way. I'm not becoming a white identitarian, even if it comes laden with guilt, and I have to prostrate myself. I mean, this is why. This is why you're seeing, you know, um, the CEO of Chick Fil A shining a black guy's shoes on stage. So, oh yeah, brilliant shoe shining. 
forced racial shoe shining. That's the path to racial harmony, isn't it? You know, I mean, that's the, surely the thing you're saying that was done wrong in the past. And yet they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to. No, we're not shining each other's shoes. OK, we're not doing that. That's totally disrespectful, which is what you were objecting to. You know, and so we're not going to do it and somehow make a rec- recompense or reparations out of this. So the, like, this is humiliating. The thing which has sort of struck me the most has been how performative some of the communication has been from yes. everybody and yes. that that no matter what your goal is no matter what your viewpoint is communication should be honest not performative yes. because as soon as you start to do that you can't tell who the, the where the truth's coming from who actually cares who doesn't care and all the things that we need to talk about most are precisely the things that we can't talk about mm. and until we are allowed to have a nuanced conversation that how do you even move forward i i think you make a really interesting point about performative uh, conversations and i i totally agree with you i think a lot of them especially from the corporations uh for example discord today published a uh, thing saying oh we're gonna do our part against the fight against whiteness um and we're going to start policing your chats and stuff so if there's anything we consider to be problematic we're coming after it we're going to get it um and that's really interesting, isn't it? Because, it, like, what does that do? You know, that doesn't make less racist. It does seem entirely performative. And like you're saying, it, it, it feels hollow because communication is usually not done uh, <laughs> essentially from compulsion, you know? Like, it, it seems that these people are not speaking from a real and true conviction. It seems that they're watching everyone else thinking, Jesus Christ, we better do something or we're going to get fucking... <laughs> Uh, so here we go. And so you've got, cause communication, when it, when two people are talking, there's loads of different factors that go into the tone and the, the, the message. You've got the sense, you've got the tone, you've got the actual words spoken, the logical structure, the semantic construction of the sentence. There's a lot that goes into us communicating. And yet when these people come out and give their kind of Oh, we, we are for diversity. Diversity is our strength. It sounds very hollow and very forced. There's, you know, there's, there's no human connection to it. That's why it feels like corporate speak. Well, so much of it's like hostage gun to the head stuff. Yeah. To me, like, I don't know if I was, I was going to say if I was the head of Black Lives Matter, but they don't, there isn't a, there isn't a single figurehead. There is, they're so distributed that you can't, you can't deal with someone, which I'd love to get your thoughts on in a second, but like if I was someone who genuinely cared about Black Lives Matter, and I got a guy who works for me who's actually uh, iffy, really cool guy from Canada who said, I don't like the way that stuff's being done over here. I, I've proposed to my university that I'm going to kind of take on, uh, try and move this movement forward. And I was like, man, like, you know, good luck to you. It's going to yeah. be, a, it's going to be a challenge, but good luck to you. But like, if I was watching that, I wouldn't think, great, we've, we've got another ally. I'd think, hang on a second. I don't trust that person. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, there's a, there's a fundamental disconnect in the way that the worldviews are being approached. And this is like, if, if anyone consider themselves, uh, essentially a conservative, uh, you, this is the thing that you really have to bear in mind. Um, the, the intersectional left, which are the, the people who that that's a, an umbrella term that will broadly describe Black Lives Matter, feminism, Antifa, you know, the other communists you see on TV, um, and people who are parroting the same talking points in the same way as them, uh, they have a view of a human being that's just very different to your own. Uh, most, uh, I, I, I'm going to get a little bit esoteric here, but like most people uh, have a kind of unitary view of a human being. The human being is, you know, you are your body. You have certain properties that are created by your body, which is your strength, how high you are, how tall you are, how far you can jump. And it also includes your brain. And people understand that the brain's a biological organ, and, and that's the source of your consciousness, your will, right? And so most people will understand that there is a biological connection between what you think and what you are. And you'll you'll know this in like your moods. You know, you, you see people when they take, uh, when they transition, they start taking hormones, they, they speak about their dispositions, the way they feel becomes different. And that's totally normal because the brain is a biological, uh, piece of, uh, you know, part of an organism and it's affected by reality. And so most people 
don't think that the will has like this this sacred sovereignty and the the will is being constrained by the body most people just kind of and without you know without articulating it like this but that's the assumptions that they'll make is that you know you've you've you're you're all a part of a biological organism but if you look at left-wing philosophy at the moment it's oh, i've got this the wrong way around but anyway um if you look at left-wing philosophy at the moment they they take a totally different approach like what what is it for a a regular person to identify a woman they'll say an adult human female right but that's a transphobic definition because that means that it can't simply be that a person identifies as a woman to be a woman and that's a very very interesting dichotomy because adult human female is very much based in biology it's very much based in in the the presence of a person you know it's an objective category i can look and see that you're an adult i can see you're a human i can see you're a female or i could check if maybe um but i i can objectively determine that however what you choose to be is only in your head and it grants license to the idea that the thoughts the consciousness are somehow the supreme sovereign over everything that's the most important thing um and i don't and, and I, I realize that this is a very esoteric way of looking at it but what that does is, is it makes it transcendental it means it's not connected to the biology the biology is actually holding it back rather than being a it being a product of the biology and so you end up getting people saying well if i if i will that i am a woman one day then i should become a woman and it's like okay <laughs> i mean i i don't know i'm not trying to be mean or anything and i know that i agree that gender dysphoria was uh, is a you know a, a problem that a person has but that doesn't mean that the will is just correct you know we it's it's there is a biological process that has not gone right to produce that result because it's an imperfect system but the will itself just because it, it you know there, there's conditions that make it feel a certain way it's not completely free and so we can't just treat it as autonomous right but they are treating it as autonomous oh, i will that i'm a woman i will that i'm this i will that I'm that. it's like yeah okay you know you can say that but you know objective reality has a different opinion and the 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 big schism between the two is whether you are a kind of person who believes in objective reality which means are rooted in biology and rooted in things that we can touch or are we actually you know sovereign wills that are trapped within this fleshy form you know so that's i i, I realize that's it's probably it sounds silly to people who aren't really thinking deeply about all of this but that's essentially the philosophical basis i think the manifestation of the will the manifestation of that inner soul somehow yeah. that is what it is yeah um well just to explain very very yeah like the, it, it comes basically from continental philosophy and it, it comes essentially from the idea that the will that there can be a perfectly good will and a perfectly good will can only be something that's not contingent on reality because it would have to be true in all times and places basically um and that it's a it's a very uh continental way of looking at it and it's not a very british way of looking at it it's a very idealistic way of looking at it uh but the the, the english-speaking world has always been very empirical uh, and not really given to tremendous flights of fancy um, and that's essentially the the major difference that we're looking at here. And so it's not a surprise that the English speaking world is looking at this thinking, what the hell is going on? Because it doesn't make any sense to them. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's annoying, frankly. What's your views on the recent removal of faulty towers German episode? Um, it's been decades since I've seen it, but if I recall correctly, wasn't that mocking racism? Like, wasn't that the point? Of I'm it? not sure. I'm absolutely certain that the point, I, I, like, like I said, it's been decades since I've watched it, but I'm sure that the point of the episode is to mock some guy who is being racist all the time and to show him as being the backwards buffoon that he clearly was. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing safe. And uh, you know what's interesting is who asked for it? Who asked for them to take these things down? You know, this is, this is the very interesting thing. Wasn't Germans don't strike me as the sort of group that are vetting... I don't know what I don't know the German culture that closely, but they don't strike me as the sort of social justice type. Uh, there's probably a bit more social justice in there than you think. Really? Um, oh yeah, I lived in Germany for eight years. They're they're, they're quite systematic thinkers, um, but it it wasn't Germans that got it pulled. It wasn't even because of Germans. Uh, it was because the guy said the N word in it, 
Um, because in the seven, yeah, 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 made in the seventies. So I don't remember that happening. I'm sh- I'm sh- I, I think I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. Tell I like us I said, in the comments been, below. Yeah, yeah, it's been decades since I've seen him, but I'm sure he says the N word in it. But that's part of the ridiculousness of the character. You know, that's part of what you're meant to be laughing at. Mm. Um, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't Germans that got to pull down, but it was got it was people who were an, aware that the mob on Twitter has certain trigger points and one of those is the n-word the other one is blackface you know so a bunch of things were taken down that had people doing blackface and again the joke is not the expense of black people it's the expense of the character doing the blackface but it doesn't matter the context is all gone now none of that matters bo selector was shite when it came out yes like that should have been (laughs) taken down for just being shit like forget yes. forget the implications of social but justice. That's whiteness. That's white meritocratic view, isn't it? Well, Avid Merion was just wank. <laughs> like regardless, regardless yeah, of that, I was, never yeah. liked that. And man, like, how dare you? How dare you make your career off the back of Craig David, who it must have murdered. And I know for a fact that he's had a conversation with Lee. What's he called? The fellow, the Avid Marion guy, the guy that's like three layers behind the person that was yeah, yeah. Craig David, that guy. Um, and uh, then Craig had this amazing resurgence mm. of a career, like what, for, sort of four or five years ago, something like that, did that song and then Justin Bieber remix and blah, blah. And now he's selling out Ibiza, doing all this stuff. But his career, make no mistake about it, his career stopped because of that character. Yeah, That's why his career tanked. Like, forget the social justice side of stuff. That's one man bearing the brunt. He's the tip of a very, very, very long spear, right? Mm. And he's bearing the brunt of all of that. Like, that is fucking disgusting. That's the thing that's terrible about it. Like, think about all the jokes that Craig David had to go through. I had this flourishing career, this young uh, mixed race uh, R&B artist, fantastic, good-looking guy, really good voice, blah, blah, blah. And then just some fella decides... Mm. Again, regardless of race, could have been a black guy, could have been a white guy, yeah. could have been an Asian guy, decides to do that. Like, that's absolutely scandalous. But that was allowed on TV at the time. How do you get something passed that is targeting one person? Well, that, that was why John Barnes said he saw no problem with it at all. It's making fun of a particular person. He wasn't making fun of a race or anything. But uh, again, now with, with this new framework of the idea of whiteness, uh, there's no such thing. Like everything that we do is inherently racial uh, to these people, so uh, none of, none of that sort of stuff is going to be made anymore. You know, so this this is over now. <laughs> yeah, is this just the new world? Because uh, being honest, like I, again, I don't want my empathy is sort of fairly crippling, and I don't want something to be on TV that makes a group of people feel uncomfortable. Like if if it was uh, if that was the sort of thing that really does make a, a big swath of the population feel uncomfortable, then I, I, like have it for the people that should have it on DVD or whatever. Sure. You know, the same way as sacrilegious books or whatever back in the yeah, day. Yeah. Don't burn the books. But in also, the same way, Facebook doesn't put pornography on. Curate the message for the audience yeah, and that, don't put it fine. in front of people who may not want to see it. Um, sure. But is is this the new world now? Have we permanently brought the guardrails in on the type of content that's going to be produced publicly? Um, yes, until there's a counter revolution. Uh, the 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 social justice types are revolutionaries, openly so. They'll tell you. I mean, Bernie Sanders has been leading this, and he's been calling it a revolution. He wrote a book called Our Revolution. You know, I mean, he's not nearly down, as far down the rabbit hole as these people, but he's still part of the same movement. Um, and they they very uh, they love communist revolutions because the idea is gonna, there's going to be an amazing revolution. We'll establish the perfect order, and therefore history's over. We can carry on living as however we we choose. Um, the, essentially, there's going to uh, like, and it looks like all of our institutions have fallen to this. It looks like every company because there's there's no solid defense against it because essentially you would have to make a defense outside of the logic of the thing. And nobody seems to be prepared to do this. Like every, every conservative should be standing saying, look, I'm not making a commentary on black lives matter as in as much as I am objecting to the moral framework that black lives matter is built on. You know, I don't believe in racial collectivization. I don't believe that we should tear down some because of the others. And I don't believe that we can ignore bad actions for good intent you know the actions matter we're like i say we but generally like 
I guess what we'll just call the right wing is very procedural. You know, how you get to where you are, the, the means are what justify the ends. And they really are on the other side. The ends justify the means. This is why they don't care if they're burning down cities. Like thousands of bu- businesses have been burned and looted in America in the past month. Thousands. It's crazy. In 40 cities, there's a part of a city that's been taken over by communists. And I'm just like, you know, like there's just no, not one thing burned or looted is justified, you know, but to the people who are supporting it. And this is everywhere. This is newspapers. This is left wing politicians. This is corporations to the people supporting it. They don't care. You know, they don't care about the damage that's been done. And that's, that's the, 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 the schism at the heart of the whole thing. And and while this order is in place, it's going to act exactly as you would think. It's going to drive towards moral perfection, like this abstract moral perfection. You, you can already see it now. Who was it? Someone, someone who did blackface, uh, in a comedy skit like 10 years ago. I, I can't remember which one it was. One of the like late night comedians Jimmy or, Fallon something. or someone like that. Yeah. Someone like that. It wasn't him, but it was someone like that. They, they were saying that they were taking like a year off or something. It's like, Oh really? Why is that? To be at you the know? time yeah. when the blackface video resurfaces. Exactly. So I mean, exactly. I, 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 I don't read really... it. The, the, the thing, the thing is this order is going to continue and it's going to continue establishing itself until essentially it becomes untenable. But, this this group of people on the other side who think well actually we think that a plurality of views and behavior matters um until they conduct their own kind of counter revolution and either not just take back the industries or create new ones um then it's going to be the social justice regime from here on out and you can see on the on twitter at the moment the, the things going around in the sky sky cinema where they're like this this Uh, like i can't remember exactly how it is but essentially this film was made in a different era and may contain scenes that are disturbing to the people and it's based you know it's for everything even like the 2019 aladdin reboot is now problematic because it's making pejorative statements about people from arabia i don't even think it is like i watched it i don't i didn't see anything curly shoes with the little bells on the end or anything like that that's not is that bad? Well, like, I don't know. This is the thing, <laughs> is right? Is But I don't know. Like, I don't, yeah, I, no, I don't. I, I don't, don't know. I don't. So Variety, yeah. I asked you this, Variety's 10 problematic films that need mm. disclaimers and discussions before and after watching. And uh, they're now on Sky. Uh, Sky. I'm they're not now sure. There. Sorry, uh, yeah, in, No, no, in, they are. In this list, Dirty mm. Harry, Forrest Gump, Indiana <laughs> Jones and the Temple of Doom, <laughs> Me right. Before You, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which only came out last year, yeah, uh, and then Children's Hour, The Searchers. So they're from the sixties. Forrest Gump, nineteen ninety four. Yeah. Dirty Harry, nineteen seventy one. Yeah. Indiana Jones, nineteen eighty four. I think that one was a, was problematic because it showed Hindu people as being the ones that yeah. can take your heart out. Uh, so yeah, I mean, th- th- this it, it, it's the circular firing squad though. Obama was talking about now. Culture is going to be cleansed, and when people do this, there's a way. It, it's also competitive. Right, there's a way. There is a way of attaining status by doing this. By taking the scalp, you get to brag and say, "Well, look, I just aided the revolution." You know, we are slightly closer to the social justice future because Indiana Jones has been censored away. Because head on a spike, exactly head on a spike, and it, and this taking things down becomes competitive sport. You know, everyone's looking at everyone else getting kudos and thinking, "Well, I need to do something." You know, I found something. You know, and so the, these campaigns will intensify. Um, until someone just says, "Well, look, I just don't agree that this is a problem." Really, if, if I'm the one, that, that's not going to happen. It. Like, it, no, it's not. Everyone's terrified. Yeah, and rightly so. Like the the silence is deafening stuff. So CrossFit, I don't know whether you've seen that the CrossFit CEO put his foot in it in a really, really huge way. They hadn't. No, I didn't. They hadn't decided to put out a message when every other company was during that yeah. period, that yeah, like five yeah. day period. They didn't do that. The, the, the black message with white writing. Yeah. Um, they, they didn't have one of those. And then Greg Glassman, the CEO, did a thing, tweeted. Um, there was a, a little bit of nuance to it when you dug in deeper, but it was, ju- it was just a stupid tweet. Like, And when you think of the current environment it was as as basically as stupid as you can get and now he's resigned and that is that has tumbled out there's no way that that wasn't going to happen there's no yeah. way that, that wasn't going to happen and I, you know from my side i think yeah he fucked up like see you later on greg like you're off yeah. mate but there has to be a line 
somewhere with what we do with culture and with what we allow in from history. People that fuck up right now, I'm like, look, mate, you, you're an adult, you know, but you can't judge the situations of history by the standards of today. However, well, yeah, you, you wouldn't because it would be irrational to do so. It's like, that was it'd made, be like the searches made in 1956. Yeah. Should that be condemned for it? Okay. No, that shouldn't. That should be taken down. Okay. Let's roll the clock forward. At what point does doing a thing which today is reprehensible, but back then was acceptable become due recompense in the now because no one's going to the people that made the searches in 1956 mm. and saying we need your head on a spike let's get rid of your blue tick on twitter let's probably do this dead. yeah but okay so at some point yeah. where the children's are in 1961 or indiana yeah. jones it was the guy in indiana jones harrison ford harrison ford Har harrison ford's head's not on a spike uh harrison ford isn't really responsible like, you'd think they'd be going after george lucas for writing it yeah you? but my point yeah. is like yeah, yeah. Th there's, but there's, they will. There's a will. there's a line somewhere, and mm. I just want I want to try and work out where that is because once we have something definite, something a, a guideline that you can work with, you can be like, okay, I can respect the boundary that has been set. Mm. I can ensure that there is a rule whereby we do not make people in this in in this world feel uncomfortable. But for as long as there isn't a rule. You can pick and choose. That's good. That's bad. That's good. That's bad. Joe Biden says in one sentence that it's uh, racist for Trump to not uh, let Chinese people in. And then two months later says that the lockdown started too late. Yeah. Like multiple think, things um, being true at once is. Yeah. I, th I think that the desire to find consistent rules is uh, in, in some ways foolish because it it comes. Uh, I'm not I'm not trying to be insulting or anything. I I I spent years struggling with that too, right? Um, it's it's and and so I you know I was foolish to think. Teach me expedite the, expedite my progress through yeah, this. Well, this yeah, yeah. Well, well, once you realize that they're going for revolution, you realize that, okay. Well, revolutions are effectively wars. You know, you're you're talking strategy and tactics, disposition of the troops on the field, whatever the whatever the field of battle is. You know, it could be Magic the Gathering or something. You know, or Dungeons and Dragons. You know, or playing card <laughs> games, or you know, video games, or whatever. It could be Hollywood movies. Whatever the field of battle is, you've got uh, people who are more powerful than others, and and they they make moves, and your side wins, your side loses. And once you realize that and it, all of social justice requires power to be defined with it, what's racism? It's power plus privilege, right? That's uh, pl power plus prejudice. Sorry. Um, that's, that's not the definition of racism we use, but that's the social justice. All of these words are defined contextually in a schema of power. Um, and once you realize that, you realize that there's no point trying to be uh, morally accurate in to what you've already said or to your own principles right um because you're not trying to establish fairness you're trying to win you know so if uh, something benefits any, my side uh, yeah, at any, yeah, 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 yeah in any direction uh, i mean it's not it's not any cost they do have they do have limits to things that they'll do and they won't do uh but those limits are way outside of the boundaries of what someone like you or me might find acceptable you know burning down business small businesses that's totally within these limits you know but uh you know i don't know insulting a trans woman or of color on twitter that's totally out of limits that's not going to do it you know so they've, they've just got very different standards um what was i going to say harrison ford the, uh <laughs> no the 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 battlefield uh right yeah so this is why you see Joe, you know, Joe Biden can say one thing when it's advantageous for his team and then the complete contradictory position when it's advantageous for his team and none of his team will call him up on this. That, it that, doesn't matter. Mate, that, that blows my mind. The fact that you can Pure have culture. someone who can reverse their position, say a yeah. thing, and then within months say another thing. These people are supposed to be the leaders of public opinion, the pinnacle yes. of how we deliver the will of the people to the, the upper echelons of the most powerful country on the planet. How on earth is that allowed to happen? Because it's the great and good doing it. 
they're the ones with their fingers on the levers of power, aren't they? Like, it should be the sort of thing that people scream from the rooftops. Like, these That's are what we're doing here. elected pub- <laughs> public officials. But it's yep. like, how is there not... How does this allow you to trust? And that's not me to say Trump's any better. You know, Trump Trump says... Trump's got a myriad of failings, but Trump is not a revolutionary. He doesn't want to overthrow the American Republic. He doesn't hate the founding fathers. He's not going to tear down any statues. He's not going to do any of... He's not going to defund the police. You know, he's not going to increase drug and crime rates. You know, things like... Like, Trump has got so many failures, but being in favor of the concept of the system is not one of them you know that he's he's at least on that whereas the left hate the system they hate what it is how it's founded in their view and so they they're going to do so much more damage than trump would ever even conceive of doing trump like again like trump actually seems to care about fairness as stupid as that sounds uh when charlottesville happened and he was like look i'm not talking about the nazis even though cnn always cut that bit out uh but on both sides of the argument there are good people that's a fairness issue you know if he if he wanted he could have said yeah the the proud or uh, sorry not the proud boys the um the nazis at charlottesville you know the the protesters did nothing wrong antifa did something wrong if he wanted it would look terrible you know a fair-minded person would be like hang on a second mm. you know they're both bad at this site you know and they, and that you know it's not just one or the other and so when they when the media when cnn when the democrats say all evil lies in the opposition you know that they're not playing for in in the ideal of establishing a fair uh playing field or or how to say not not just playing field but just atmosphere a society that's fair given the fact that we have this crazy covid situation that's just happened everyone's mm. got heightened emotions heightened intensity yes. their time on site has been increased they haven't got to see the people that they love they're scared about catching a pathogen which is like evolutionary wired into us to be something to be afraid of sure. so you've got this uh ambient anxiety right this low level ambient anxiety that just sits in the background then on top of that, you have this constant news cycle, which this year has just been. Trump got impeached this year. Yeah, this year, which feels and no like, one cares. Which feels like eighty years ago. It does, doesn't it? No one cares. So you've got you've got that's happened. You've got the yeah. the news, which is being uh, either misrepresented, uh, distorted, either purposefully or just due to the fact that they've got to try and keep up. Which means that there's going to be uh, willful and just accidental negligence going on. Uh, then. All of the George Floyd situation, you've got the subsequ- uh, subsequent riots, you've got, and then you've got the upcoming presidential election. Like, mm. this is the time where we should be trying to be as precise as possible with the things that we say, as honest and as truthful as possible, because any slight deviation from that will be magnified. And then when you add layer upon layer upon layer, like people that getting all of their truth from Twitter, like just from mm. some guy on Twitter yep. and the fact that you can now do that and be a, a story which people start to repeat and becomes part of the canon like it doesn't surprise me that this situation that like, when you fully reflect on 2020 it mm. doesn't surprise me that we have this level of inflammatory discussion people talking past each other and just total the performative communication everything it doesn't surprise me it, it was me. a long time coming uh, the, the the Twitter stuff I find really interesting uh, because it's how it's affecting the media class. Uh, there was a leaked uh, memo from the Daily Beast where the the high ups were trying to. Well, they, I think it was they were forbidding the use of Twitter during office hours because they felt that Twitter and it's just, I think broadly more uh, broadly accurate that Twitter itself is actually doing damage to the journalistic profession because all the journalists are on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, like, like, yeah, the 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 and fake news is being widely perpetrated by it like for example when the football lads went to defend the statue of churchill uh the fake news surrounding this and the misinformation surrounding this is quite staggering uh the claim that they're nazis is not true and the proof of this is in the fact they were protesting against a statue of Winston Churchill being damaged. Gary Lineker or like, you know, some of the famous football tweet out going, why are these Nazis trying to save a statue of Winston Churchill? It's like, well, that's the very fact that you're asking the question means you need to do more research. Doesn't it, Gary? You know, you should have looked in this and go, okay, well, hang on. Are these Nazis? And then you go, oh no, they're doing Nazi salutes. And it's because there was a side on uh, picture and you could see people putting up their hands, both hands like this. 
uh, because they do, you know, they do this clap chant in the thing and they were chanting England, but from the side, oh, you, you can see how that might look For like an Nazi sake. salute. Uh, but that was, and even people like Julia Hartley Brewer were chant, like repeating this. And then there was another fake bit of footage where someone had imposed over them, uh, the audio of some, uh, white nationalist or national front protest from like 2017 where they're chanting we're racist and we like it as and this was Jesus again repeated everywhere on the radio on lbc i heard all of it, and it's like that wasn't true you know the the football lads there are many failings again like with donald trump you know many ethical failings of what they've done however they aren't nazis they are actually kind of like you know the post-world war ii british patriots you know they firmly believe that britain's role in the war was a good thing they firmly believe in winston churchill's leadership and they firmly believe in the narrative that we were on the side of side of right and not on the side of the nazis and yet they go oh look at these nazis i mean what we can do you know did you see the map of voters in the UK that was shared just after the general election and it had who voted by age and it went hyper viral on Facebook. And it basically showed that um, the the implication was old people voted conservative. That's how Boris got in power. Did you see this? Yes. That became not only, not only something that people thought, but fully bullet, like it was straight fact and it was a map taken from 2017, 2016, I think. Really? I didn't know that. Yes. See, it's amazing how this stuff goes viral and then creates the fake news. But it's just like, some it's, guy, some fella, yeah. you know, it's, or some girl from Bristol yeah, or Wigan or, yeah. you, you know, just made like it up. Salford. And it, like, it's, it's, it was a fact, but not in this particular circumstance. Yeah. But again, like the fact that that is... The way that the culture develops now should terrify everybody, no matter what side you're coming from. Yeah. Uh, so social media has been a curse that we weren't ready for. Um, and I, I mean, it, it's probable that something similar to the effect that we're seeing now would have happened given enough time. I think it's probably inevitable uh, given the philosophies and, you know, them percolating through the culture it probably would have done. But I think social media is just essentially an accelerating factor that's just got everything to go so much faster. And like th there was a study that showed that Twitter activates the same parts of the brain as being in a fight. So when you get on oh, Twitter, Jesus. you're in fight mode. You, oh no, totally. You might not be moving, but your heart's pumping, your adrenaline's going, you're, and your brain is, is you know, as you're like arguing with someone on Twitter, you may as well be going to have a fight with that person. So it's like, okay, you're essentially stepping into the world's largest fight club when you log into Twitter and Fuck get ready me. to get punched because everyone gets punched on Twitter. You know what I mean? And so it, like, it's just, it's not good. So and what, the do thing, we, what do we do, well, man? Like, well, the the problem is that the the interpretation of the facts uh, diverging is fine. Everyone expects a divergent view of the interpretation of the facts, but because people are sat in their online echo chambers and there can't really be any other way of doing this apart from having it so that you don't get to choose what you follow. Uh, because when people get to choose what they follow, they follow the things that they like, and that means they only get that perspective, uh, one you know, one view. And so it, it was that there was a, a plurality of opinions on the same facts, but now there is not. There's there's divergent facts for each side. And I really wish when Kellyanne Conway said, "Oh, there are alternative facts," and it was like, "Ha ha, there's no such thing as alternative facts." It's like. Yeah, there are. There are facts you're not listening to. You're not paying attention to. Like, you know, despite being 13%, you know, that's a fact that you didn't want to mention. It's an alternative fact. It's still real, and yet you leave it out of the narrative. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it's now at the point where we don't even agree the same things happened. You know, the, yeah. the, the, the London bubble is like, oh, well, there were Nazi salutes. People with video cameras didn't capture any Nazi salutes. These people do not profess to be Nazis and they wish to defend Winston Churchill. What do we do? Well, in the meantime, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, obviously. But what, one thing that I do is I make sure that even if I hate it, I watch information from sources I don't agree with. Um, and there are a bunch of sources that I really don't agree with and I found even more insufferable. But I've continued to force myself to watch these things, to get, you know, for, to watch certain people's coverage of certain events. To get the other facts. To get the other facts. That what are these? Left out. What would you say? So let's say that I am, which I am, a person who wants to try and at least get a broad cross section 
of what's going on. What, what would you advise that I read and listen to? Well, I mean, the, the, the most obvious place to start is like, like if you're going to watch the mainstream news, um, watch Fox News and MSNBC, and you'll hear two sides of the same narrative that will include facts that the other one didn't include. Uh, so you will learn things from both sides. Um, and that's essentially what you've got to do on any subject, any, any given event. Uh, so I, I find myself, you know, watching like David Pakman or Novara media and at the same time watching Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson. And I, I, I mean, like I, I don't really like Fox news. I don't really like any of the personalities other than Tucker Carlson. Cause I think he's actually on the money a lot these days. Um, but the, basically you've got to find yourself a sort of list of people on either side of any political debate who you find tolerable that you can watch, even if you disagree with them. You've just got to figure it out, you know, and you've just got to accept that they see the world differently to you, but you still do need to have both of those things. This is something that um, Hayek uh, pointed out in The Road to Serfdom, that the, the dangers of totalitarianism, the reason that totalitarian societies become like they are, is not because of propaganda. In, in every society, there's propaganda. It's just in a liberal society, there's a plurality of propaganda pulling you in all different directions. Uh, so you're introduced to all different kinds of things. So you don't ever get, just, okay, I only heard one thing. So I believe that's reality and that's it. You know, because you see, it makes it so else. messy that it's almost impossible to work out what's going on. And what, it, well, what no, is, no, 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 no. It makes it impossible to work out what's going on. It means it's m much more difficult to find yourself in a political cult where you've only heard one side of the story. You've never heard the other side. Okay. Uh, so you, you can still, you know, you can find out what's going on from all this plurality of sources. It's just, you won't be radicalized to one particular worldview or the other. Um, and it's, it, it's not, that it's not wrong for people to have their own political opinions. They put out, obviously everyone's free to do so. Um, the, the danger with totalitarian societies is it creates radicals and crazies who are zealots for the system because they only ever hear one thing. And so the other people must be evil and our social media feeds are doing that for us. So it's really important that we remember that we're not 100% right. And we are actually kind of self radicalizing and we've got to try and decondition ourselves. We need to take everything that we read with an increasing pinch of salt but the problem is yes. now as you've identified the old bastions of truth that we would be able to rely on a long time ago they're no longer there because yes. they also have an agenda and they also have pressures and they also get stuff wrong and like so yeah again layer all of this on top of the worst global pandemic in a hundred years and everyone being locked in the house and heightened yep. tensions and emotions and stuff like that. 30 people died in the black lives matter protests in America. 30 people died. Like there are videos of guy, you know, this one guy got beaten unconscious, then his teeth kicked in just as he's laying on the floor. Someone punts him straight in the face. And I watched it. And I was like, Fuck. you know, and you know, 30 police officers in London were injured at the Black Lives Matter protest, and then another 20 when the football lads went down. You know, again, I'm not going to say that it's only one side that's done it or anything mm -hmm. like that, you know, but but if I were a partisan on either side, I absolutely would. And the BBC and Sky News absolutely did make it sound as if the Black Lives Matter, the mostly peaceful protest that injured 30 cops, you know, like that's you see not the video of the horse protest. running down the street. Yeah, yeah, because someone chucked a bike and rocks at it and stuff like that. And, and the then woman it, knocks, the, it knocks some, yeah. some pedestrian over. Man, yeah, yeah. like, uh, that's, that's the thing as well. Like, I feel, even with this channel, like, I'm, I feel like I'm treading on ice with everything that I say. And I'm like, hang on, I, I want, I know that I have reasonable views. I also know that there are people out there that require sense making to be done. Anyone that's listening, the two best podcasts that I've heard on this is Sam Harris's Can We Pull Back From The Brink, which is phenomenal sense making. And the most recent Brett Weinstein and Eric on uh, Joe Rogan, which was also fantastic. If you listen to those two uh, pieces of content, it'll take you maybe five hours in total, I think, but you will be in full possession of a yeah. bunch of facts and a bunch of opinions and sam's final piece on his podcast which i absolutely love is where he says can we imagine a society in which the color of your skin was treated the same as the color of your hair that would be an a racial society yes. and a race agnostic society and to me looking at what's happening at the moment this is so much more divisive than it is uh, cohesive, right? <laughs> and the thing which makes it feel so, like it was so close, or at least I felt like it was so close, right? At the beginning of this pandemic, 
I had uh, Dr. Eric Feigelding, who used to be an advisor to the World Health Organization, on really good episode. And I was just like, look, tell us about it. And the one thing that came up to me there was, it doesn't even rain everywhere on the planet at the same time. There are very few things which unite humanity globally in one turn. Very few things that remind us. And there was that famous quote, I think it was um, like uh, one of the mid-70s presidents that said, can you imagine how quickly we would forget all of our terrestrial differences if we had a threat from an alien civilization? Wasn't that Reagan who said that? Don't know. Someone. But my point right. is my point is that when you are as a species, as a as a humanity, is facing this threat, you do combine together. I know mm. what lockdown in Wuhan kind of feels like. I know what the f- a little bit different, but you get my point. Like I have something, oh, yeah. something in There's a shared with- human experience. There. Absolutely. And I was like, at the beginning of this, the first thing I thought, or one of the first things I thought was, wow. This really could be, in a very bizarre sort of way, something that unites us, something that creates a globe which actually appreciates what we are as a species, you know, and just how tenuous our grasp on existence is. And it felt to me like, look, this is kind of getting there. And then... Yeah, I, I, that sounds too optimistic to me. I, I don't. I, I think the worst, uh, the, sorry, the best that the coronavirus could have done is just delayed, and it probably did. You know, this this maybe would have happened, you know, three months ago if it wasn't for the coronavirus. Um, but the, the the these unresolved tensions, man. I can. It's totally valid to feel like we're in sort of fall of the republic territory here, because we are. I mean, this is, uh, you know, probably something like crisis of the third century if we're comparing Western civilization to Rome. Uh, so we've pr- we've, I think we probably do have a couple hundred years left to go. Uh, but I think it's evident that whatever we've been doing to bring us to this point is leading us on a path to destruction. Something's and wrong, so, right? Yeah, something's wrong. Something's deeply wrong. Um, this was probably uh, built into the Enlightenment uh, which I, I'm not, I don't relish to have to say, uh, because you know, I, I, I'm a product of it and I believe in the ideals, but you have to be honest about the things that are going wrong. And these people are pushing for like absolute freedom and they seem to be wanting to destroy everything that we have. It took a long time to get to this position. It was very, a lot of hard work from a lot of good people. And I'm not prepared to call them all bad people because the moral standards have changed. You know, that's, and it's unacceptable. It's, it, what's really insulting about that is it's essentially saying that the Roman Empire's army could never have learned to use guns, right? Because we, we don't, like morality develops over time. You know, we, there, there was a time when literally no one on earth questioned the institution of slavery. Why would you? What the hell are you talking about? You know, and then there became a time where people did start questioning it. Then it came a time where it was essentially like a moral revolution where we're like, no, there can't be any slavery. You know, then it, then democracy comes. No, everyone should have the franchise. Why should these people? Like, it's like, okay, this is great. And it's the same as developing It's You know, so we're saying that like people back in, you know, the, the 16th century or whatever, you know, if they had been raised now or, you know, introduced to our ideas, our concepts, they couldn't have believed that actually that they were somehow yeah. innately deficient, that they had, exactly. they had poorer morals inbuilt into them, not that exactly. they were just a product of their environment. Exactly. Which is amazing for the philosophy that views everything as a political contextual battle, you know. But yeah, exactly. You know, they are the product of their time. You know, that's what do you, what do you expect? Most people end up re- representing the societies in which they've been raised and their society had normalized moral standards that we think are terrible. And it's only because we've got a different society that everyone agrees, you know? And so it's, it seems to be doing them a great disservice. It's, it's awful. It's I, a, I mean, it's a, jo- a Jordan Petersonism where he talks about how um, people that believe that if they were back in Maoist China, or in uh, Stalin's Russia, that they would have done it differently, that they would have behaved differently. And it's like, you would have to be an extraordinary human for that to be the case. And if you're a determinist, then, you know. Well, yeah. yeah. yeah, But I mean, but no, but that's that's exactly the point. It's like, why why would you think that they wouldn't react rationally to the pressures that have been put on them? Right? Because they they are. They, you know, they get... it's a rational reaction in the in the situation that they're in. It might not be a good one, but you'll you'll when you're in their place, you'll see why they took those decisions. And depending on the kind of person you are, you might take them too. And that's them. There must be an element of 
this on the other side of the fence, though, on the Black Lives Matter protesters that have a, a small minority who have tried to potentially hijack this movement to move it toward ends that the vast majority of people that are supporting it don't actually want. And then they're kind of getting dragged along. And they're, again, they're products of perhaps the the loudest, the most Machiavellian, I don't know yep. how it works. And the main... Oh, no, you, you're spot on. That's exactly how it the, works. The main problem that I can see is that without a single leader for Black Lives Matter, from a um, distributed leadership, we can always continue to move forward perspective, that's great. But from a negotiation perspective, so that you can actually start to move forward productively with the rest of the world, like who do you talk to? Yeah, there's a problem with um, the sort of secular religion that has become uh, the, the the radical left wing. It, essentially, it is all an aspect of communism, I would say. Uh, the the idea of the borders vast, and boundaries sorry, the, the are vast problematic. Majority, vast majority Not for, of the no, people no, following yeah, yeah. it don't think that. So how of course, how have of they adopted or how have they uh, internalized this? Like who's who's giving it to them? Um, people who are very clever, people who have been training for this. This, this is people who have been studying for this for their whole lives. I mean, this is what Robin DiAngelo is talking about. You know, this they they're very very carefully thought about these things. And they're very good at laundering their ideas through other ideas that are totally reasonable. You know, we want police reform. Totally reasonable. That means defund the police. Totally unreasonable. You know, like there's, there's, a, there's not only one way of doing it. Um, I was, I was going to say something else very quickly then as well, but I've forgotten what it was. So, yeah. Got it. Um, last thing, mate. How would you advise someone communicates now moving forward in a productive manner do you have a way that you try and do that um don't be a hero because these people are on on edge uh, there's blood in the water and they they will come for you you know they'll do as much damage to your life as they can and they'll feel justified in doing it um they they will ruin you if if they can uh, so don't be a hero um but if it's something that's really bothering you and you, you feel tremendously motivated to do something, there are lots of um, people who are trying to push back in lots of different ways. And you can do your part by, like, you know, buying their book or buying, you know, the t shirt or whatever it is that they're doing to finance themselves because competition to the moral worldview that's being presented in Black Lives Matter and Antifa uh, is being attacked. You know, it's just being attacked for being in opposition to this at this point. So you, the, these people definitely need support, but it is also worth, um, trying to go past the idea of police reform because uh, essentially you can be like, well, there are many ways to skin a cat, right? Like I might, I might want police reform too, but I don't think defunding the police is the way to get police reform. So I'm going to, you know, I have a different idea for that, which might be, and I mean, there are lots of ideas like in America, something like 70 percent of the police don't police their own districts that they live in. So they're from out of town. They're coming. That's you know, that's you can see why that would be a concern. Right. So you might want police reform. So it's like, you know, 70 percent do police their own districts or something like that. You know, so there, there are other ways to get um, to, to resolve issues and there are issues to be resolved. Um, but I guess, you know, you just have to have these very difficult conversations if you want. But you'll probably get disavowed very quickly. It's hard, man. Like I love, yeah. I, I absolutely adore having, having nuanced conversations. This is what I would yeah. spend my entire time doing, trying to work out exactly where the truth lies. This isn't mm. this interesting, but again, like the things that we need to talk about the most are precisely the things that we can't talk about. And yeah. it makes, that's what scares me because I'm like, I don't know whether I'm going to say something which yesterday was reasonable and yet today is a landmine. And as you can see with, we should pull this show down off TV, we should do this. You're talking about some shows, like uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that are a year old. Yep. You're talking about something where the rules have changed because I, maybe people were up in arms. I don't know. But I didn't see people being up in arms when that film came out. It got a bunch of big accolades, got the huge director behind it, Quentin Tarantino and blah, blah. And I'm like, I have conversations for a living. This is what I do for hours and hours per week, as do you. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you're a slightly bigger pair of brass balls than I do. But my point is that 
as someone who is like a professional conversationalist, mm. I am real scared about yeah. about some of the conversations that I want to have. I want to have these conversations because I think that they're worthy, because I think they're interesting, because we are absolutely living through history. Like, oh my God, mm. like if 2020 isn't some history for you there, like I don't know what it is. Yeah, I, I think it's probably going to have uh, a lot more written on it than the early 2000s. <laughs> yeah. well, but, um, but yeah, no, you, you, are, you are right. I mean, this is why I've been in such consistent opposition to this worldview for such a long time, because it was eminently uh, demonstrable from the small spaces in which it had taken over that it very rapidly becomes tyrannical and imposes a kind of regime of terror on people. And lo and behold, now that it's taken over the mainstream culture, which I said that it would, I said this was coming, now it's taken it over, now everyone feels afraid. Like, you can see people, like, uh, Robin D'Angelo was on Jimmy Fallon the other day, and uh, the top reply to the tweet that had the video in it is, you look like a hostage. And it's like, yes, he does, because if he says something wrong, he's getting cancelled, and he's never coming back, because there's no amount of forget, there's no method of forgiveness or penance with this religion, especially when status can be assumed by simply attacking someone who's morally inferior. You know, when, while, while you can raise yourself up by doing nothing else than tearing other people down, you're never going to be safe. You are never going to be safe. It's why I've been warning about this. Um, look, Carl, it's been uh, a year since you were on. I have to give you as well as a parting note, I have to give you a very big thank you for coming on last year. It was a huge help to the channel. It's been a big part of the growth, um, and I, I couldn't appreciate you more for, for coming back on. Uh, Teespring, oh, is, that the, is that the only place that we can get you now? Uh, no, 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 Spreadshirt now. <laughs> <laughs> you are kidding me. You got yeah. banned from a t-shirt site. Yeah, but the, the, it wasn't for political reasons. They, 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 I'd, I'd done a parody of a Star Wars logo. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I hadn't done it, but you know, we'd done a parody of a Star Wars t-shirt. And they were like, no, 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 that violates copyright or it might do. So we're like, okay, fine, we'll take it down. And then like two weeks later, they brought it back up again, accused me of re-uploading it, which I hadn't. And then we're like, yeah, that's it. And it's like, right, okay. So I don't think it was about that. I think it was actually about politics. I'm telling but, uh, you, the most demonetized yeah. man on the internet. Quite possibly. Quite possibly. So where, where can people go? They want to find out more. Where uh, should they do stuff now? They they can just um, search for a CAD daily, A double K A D daily. Uh, but I'll I'll have uh, something. I'll have my own site in a few months, hopefully. So, uh, but I'll let everyone know through my YouTube channel where to go. Uh, so. Amazing. Thank you very much for your time, mate. Thanks very much, man.